15-year-old web design software development and digital marketing company based in Chicago, also a proud member of the B Corp community as is Greenhouse Data. That's right. And uh, Greenhouse Data, we are a cloud hosting and co-location ho company. So we build data centers. Um, we focus on efficiency. We buy 100% green power. And we have seven facilities across the country. We're actually headquartered in Cheyenne, Wyoming, um, which I'll touch on later is a great spot for green data centers. So our main question here, is a green internet possible? You know, we've got over 3 billion people using the net. Um, and everything you do online contributes. So um, we're talking about your website, your email systems, uh, cloud backups, enterprise applications, they're all using data centers. And of course that extends to your personal life as well. Every time you're on Facebook, you're Googling, you're streaming a video, there are emissions being generated every time you use a computer or your smartphone, not just locally on your device, but tens or hundreds of miles away in data centers. Um, and I know um, Tim's got a few great stats here. Um, including the fact, you know, with our little image here, that the internet industry, this is one of my favorites, um, it's about 2% of all global carbon emissions, according to Greenpeace, and that's about the same as the aviation sector. It's pretty mind-blowing. Hey, Joe, I'm not seeing your, uh, uh, your presentation window here. Oh, boy. So I, uh, all I see is the title, title window. All right, let me get you going. I'm not, Thanks, not sure if the, the viewers can see the same, but there we go. Look at that. We're up. Okay. Um, cool. So, so yeah, once again, think. there's more and more people problem. online every day. And um, it, it's growing. So. Over the next five years, we expect 60% more people to be online, and there'll be 50 billion devices online in five years. It's, it's pretty boggling. Yeah, that includes Internet of Things, uh, which, as you can see on the, on the screen, is, uh, averages out to about seven devices per person on the planet. So what's behind those apps and your website? Um, it's data centers. You know, it's traveling through a network. You may be familiar with the concepts, but if you actually walk into one, it's pretty incredible. Um, you know, you've got rows and rows of equipment. There's thousands of square feet, um, and these are located generally miles away, and you'll never see them. It's kind of like the silent giants of the Internet. Um, so just a quick description of what it's like. Um, you walk in, there's a receptionist, and then crazy amounts of futuristic security, um, video cameras, you get a visitor badge, um, you have to be buzzed in, and then to get onto the actual floor, you pass through a man trap, so that's like a small room between two doors that can't be open at the same time. Um, someone has to use their fingerprint generally to get you past biometrics. Um, then you walk down a long hallway, cables overhead, and you'll reach another set of locks at the door to the actual floor. And then inside, as you can see here in this picture, it's just white, you know, white noise, white walls, cacophonous sound of servers everywhere. Um, it, it really is just a data warehouse. And um, so each of those servers is, is split up among rows and rows of racks. Um, and then generally those are, have a sealed off kind of interior space. Um, and I'll talk about the point of that here in a moment. Um, so beyond the servers themselves, there's some supporting equipment that also consumes energy. Um, so that's the cooling, the lighting, backup power, all the other systems that aren't just raw computers. And so we do have a metric in the data center industry to measure that efficiency. It's kind of rough, um, but it is the industry standard. Um, it can be kind of tough to measure and um, you know, if you're evaluating a provider, you definitely want to see their, their proof of this. But it's called the PUE, and that's the power usage effectiveness. So that's just a simple ratio of the total power used by the whole building uh, divided by just the computing power. Um, so
So the average is a 2.0, which means that for every single watt used by a server, there is another watt used by everything else, the lighting and the backup and the cooling. Um, so a very efficient facility usually has the PUE between 1.1 and 1.5. So now you know how we rate efficiency, how much power is really being pulled down by data centers and the internet. Um, it's over 30 gigawatts a year. In just the United States, um, that's 34 large coal plants total output. And this is increasing at a constant basis. So the carbon footprint of a pretty small data center, it's maybe a medium size, 10 megawatts, um, that can range from 3 million to over 130 million kilograms of carbon dioxide. That's 143,000 tons of emissions annually. Um, so what that adds up to here is uh, if the internet were a country, it's sixth for electricity use um, worldwide. And that's as the many US. of you likely know, yeah. I'll Sorry, go ahead, I was just, just going to say that's behind the U.S., India, Russia, Japan, and China. This number six would be the yep. internet. Um, and in the United States, we we barely get any energy from renewables. So that's a, a whole lot of coal power that's going towards our applications and services. Now, it's not only power emissions that we have in, the, in data centers um, that has an environmental footprint. Um, you know, we have batteries for backup power. Um, those have a limited lifespan of two or three years. And um, as you know from just your batteries at home, they have to be disposed of properly um, and or recycled because generally they're lead acid. Um, there's harmful mining that's involved for the minerals that are used to produce those. Um, there's a ton of chemicals that are used in data centers um, for coolant and for fire suppression and cleaning um, that often involves freon um, that causes ozone depletion. There are alternatives um, with zero ozone depletion potential, um, but they often still have global warming potential and they can trap heat in the atmosphere. Um, and then also massive diesel generators. So one of the key factors of a data center is it has to be running all the time. Um, you know, no one can escape using a digital service these days. It's essential for business and your personal life. So if the power goes out, it, um, it's got to stay running. And so just at Greenhouse Data last year at a single location, we burned through over 6,000 gallons of diesel fuel. Um, and we're a relatively small provider, and that's mostly just burning for testing and to avoid having it going stale. Um, so you, but you that's, you these are operations that are required. You yeah. don't, you don't, do you keep those, those diesel generators going all 24-7, or is that you just have them, you said this, you burned off to, to go avoid going stale or for testing. Those things just get regular runs, and that's where that 60, 300 gallons of, of fuel comes from? Yeah, that's that's correct. We definitely do not have them running 24-7. Um, we spin them up once per quarter just to make sure that everything is working correctly. Um, and then beyond that, um, it's just to use up the fuel, um, or we can also drain it and dispose of it another way. So we won't generally burn through a full tank, um, at least not here. Um, most of what we are using it for is just testing. Um, I don't think that we had any power outages in the last year um, that required us to spin it up. So it was pretty much testing only. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Um, oh, and I, I would just like to add that if anyone else has a question at any time, uh, feel free to type it either in the chat or in the question window. Um, so last thing on not just emissions here, is that there's also, of course, electronic waste. So computers have a limited lifespan. Um, that applies to servers, too. And it can't just go in a landfill. Offshore disposal, especially, is really, really bad news. Um, so you want to make sure that your provider is going to be disposing of their equipment properly. <clears throat> 
So how can we make data centers greener? Um, the biggest thing is going to be facility design and, of course, green power. Um, so on the facility side, there's a number of ways to make cooling and pump it directly into the data center. So you're not using any coolant. You're using way less energy. And this only works in some geographic areas, um, but it's a great way to lower that PUE um, and have a more efficient facility. Alongside that, there is aisle containment, which basically just means when you're pumping that cold air in, you can't have it mixing with the hot air that's already inside the data center. So all these servers are pumping out a ton of heat, and you want that air to go directly outside and not be a drain on your AC system. Um, beyond that, there's, of course, Energy Star equipment, um, efficient servers and power supplies. Even having a neat, neat cabling can make a huge difference on that airflow um, and really, really improve that. So if you walk into a data center on a tour with your IT team and you see messy cables all over the place, chances are it's not a very efficient operation. Um, you know, that, those little details aren't just about being professional. They actually can impact um, how a data center operates. Really um, never had, had any idea about that. Yep. Yeah, and, and um, you know, I've read even it can imp increase or decrease PUE by you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 just from those cablings um, wow. and things like blanking out the extra space on a server rack um, so that air isn't passing through that. Um, so oh. containment is is huge. Um, on the the green power front. Um, this can be a very tough one, and, and Tim, maybe you can speak a little bit to, to how you tried and struggled to, to find a provider that is using green power. Uh, sure, yeah, and, 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 and for us it was a, a, a web hosts. Um, we went out and looked for, we wanted to get uh, a web host that we could partner with for our clients as well as for ourselves, um, and we wanted to find one, you know, preferably that was powered by 100% renewables, um, and maybe not necessarily RECs, but but just renewables. What we found is that um, in many cases, what the company made up for or had in in renewable power, they often lacked in other areas like reliability or customer service or you know some other kind of basic business functions. And so we we bounced around from a bunch of different hosting providers uh, before finally settling with on a partnership with you with you guys. And it was um, it was challenging because we would you know no one wants to have their customers calling them and saying our website is down. What, what have you done? You know, um, again for us it's website stuff. It's not necessarily like internal IT you know infrastructure, but it's the same kind of principles apply. Yeah, and and one of the big struggles we have as as a smaller provider with green power is that we don't necessarily have the capital to install the size of. Um, of on-site generation that we might need in order to keep these facilities running. You know, as you saw earlier in the presentation, there's an incredible amount of power going in, even into a smaller data center. And if you are not, you know, a, a very massive provider, um, it's going to be really hard to be able to set up the 10, 20, or 50 megawatt solar fields um, and keep up the kind of constant generation and then the additional storage for when you can't generate um, to keep your facility powered by green energy. So those things are helpful even if they're supplemental um, and it's great to have on-site generation, but ultimately what you're going to see from most green hosts are that they're buying renewable credits. Um, and so those are their own mixed bag as well that I won't delve into too much here. Um, but it is important if you're checking in with the green host um, that they have some kind of traceable, you know, certified credits um, and preferably if their REC provider can point to specific projects that are being funded by those, uh, by those credits. Sure. So the last thing I'll talk about on my side here real quick. Um, is the concept of virtualization and utilization, um, which is uh, it's a little bit abstract, but I won't get too technical. Um, so basically, on a regular computer, 
you know, you're running just your single operating system on top of it, and then your applications are running within the operating system. Um, but on a virtual server, you can essentially run 10, 20, or 50 computers on a single server. So it breaks up the total available resources and then gives them to each machine. So it might split 10 gigabytes of memory into five machines that each have two gigabytes. So that way, you really get to use all the resources available. And this is a, is a big problem um, for places that aren't virtualized. Um, you know, as you can see, virtualizing 100 servers is the equivalent of removing 89 cars from the street just in emissions there. Um, and meanwhile, there's 10 million servers worldwide that aren't doing anything. They're not running any loads at all. And so that's the equivalent of eight power plants. Um, so it's really important if you're running your own data centers um, or if you are evaluating um, a hosting provider that you make sure that the computing equipment that is getting power on a 24-7 basis is being used actively um, because otherwise all it's doing is wasting. And that's the definition of a zombie server? Yep, that is a zombie server. I, I've never heard that term before, but I love it and it's giving me visions. Um, <laughs> Nightmares, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, great, do you want me to move forward from here? Sure, yeah, yeah, I'll let you take over, Tim, talk uh, a little bit about things um, more on the website side and, sure, and how yeah. you can optimize um, for, for better use there. Yeah, uh, unlike uh, Greenhouse Data, Mighty Bytes focuses on, on, on the more front-end user-facing stuff. We build websites, we create software applications, and so uh, a lot of our efforts on making the things that we do more efficient, user-friendly, and then hence energy efficient uh, are focused on, on that front, and so a lot of the information that Joe just shared is that was actually news to me. Um, it's, and it, it's The whole idea of a data center has been this kind of like crazy, kind of mysterious you know, shrouded in mystery kind of thing. So it's it's really great to see how that all actually plays out. Um, on the front end, uh, there's this uh, great site called the HTTP Archive, uh, and they crawl the web and they take stats. It's httparchive.org, I believe it is, um, and they take stats on on web usage, on on just you know crawling the internet, looking for stats. Really interesting stuff. Uh, in March of this year, they 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 said that the average web page itself is over two megabytes. Um, which is about 20 times larger than it was in 2003. So if you can imagine being in a small, you know, in a rural area on, a, on your cell phone and trying to, you know, trying to use uh, cellular data to load a two megabyte web page, you can imagine as a user how frustrating that would be and, and how inefficient. Um, so inefficiencies can happen on the server side, um, you know, when computers are serving pages to web browsers, but then they also can happen on the front end uh, user side. Uh, as in, in the scenario that I just mentioned as well is like, you know, we've all been on our phone trying to access a piece of content that wasn't optimized for our phone, and so we waste a lot of time doing the finger dance, trying to, you know, get the content to a, a usable, readable space, state. Um, you know, it's one thing for blog posts, it's if you're actually trying to do things like book an airline ticket or, you know, make a donation or something on something that's not optimized for the device that you're on, you can imagine how much energy is, is actually wasted there because it takes you three times as long to do what you actually want to do. Um, so a lot of times in terms of making, you know, greening up the internet, uh, some of the most, you know, th common things that, that are, that are I wouldn't call them offenses necessarily, but I mean the, the, one of the most common things that keep a, a website or, or mobile application from being green are the lack of optimization from a content and UX perspective, um, as well as just performance optimization, speed and reliability, and then uh, green hosting, um, which I think is a really impo important thing as, as Joe was just talking about. And in terms of, uh, so when, when Mighty Bytes, uh, you know, kind of started learning about this stuff, we became a B Corp in 2011, and uh, a lot of the questions on the B Impact Assessment, the certification process that you go through to become a B Corp, are all about supply chain. And so they ask you a lot of questions about, you know, what you what you do to, to minimize things like travel and, and emissions and, and that kind of thing, um, as well as just where you source your supplies from. 
in terms of everything from office supplies to anything that goes on in your supply chain. And as a web design firm, we didn't really look at ourselves as having much of a supply chain because we didn't make socks or create you know, air conditioner filters or anything like that. We, ba we built virtual things. So uh, for us, it was people and pixels. And, you know, we kind of looked, started looking further into the whole pixel side of things and, you know, obviously realized that those use electricity. And so we decided to retool our own internal process to figure out how we can build more uh, user-friendly and energy-efficient uh, websites and, and, and applications. So we, four areas that we kind of came up to uh, in, our, in terms of, figuring out what we can improve uh, and, and, and I think any web, web design or software development firm could, could do this as well was findability and relevant relevance uh, any content that's easier to find is obviously uses less resource so it's, if it's easy to find in searches search engines as well as easy to find on your own website it uses less resources because users are not trying to bounce around constantly finding stuff that's not relevant to what they have. So good taxonomy is really important there, uh, good search engine and SEO practices, good, good content strategy, etc. Um, and then once found, that content should serve users' needs you know, quickly and efficiently. We should make sure that, that it's actually you know, serving the purpose of which, to which it's intended. Um, design and user experience is also another big area, as I just mentioned, trying to like book an airline ticket or make a donation on something that's not uh, optimized for your device. That's a, that's a really, really uh, important thing. Design helping help users accomplish tasks quickly. So we want to make sure that, you know, they're able to easily access content and, and accomplish tasks across platforms and devices. Uh, this includes people with uh, disabilities, so making sure that things are accessibility compliant as well. Um, all of those things, if you're using web standards, they're, they're all going to use uh, less, less resources, less front-end resources. Um, and then uh, helping users make more sustainable choices is another part that falls under that whole design and user experience thing. So in other words, uh, you know, if you're checking out in a shopping cart, you know, off your blog it doesn't look like a mess when they run it through their printer because as you can imagine it costs lots of, of paper if you're printing off something that's not optimized for that device um, and then uh, performance optimization is, is simply that pages that load quickly and efficiently is on as many devices as possible use less resources so if making sure that your pages load fast that they're reliable that the content is reliable that, that, that there's a certain reliability there and, and um, and, and, and that those load across devices and platforms. And then finally, I put more sustainable components in here um, because I think, you know, green hosting is probably the most uh, important part of these, but I think what, when you have green philosophies and green practices that go into creating something, your, the, the, the result on the outside uh, when something is finished, when you finish creating things, is more sustainable as well. So obviously green hosting is one of these. Um, but then things like lean and agile workflows, uh, things that are iterative and reduced waste. Um, there's been a whole, whole, whole movement towards the lean startup model of like build, measure, learn, and then pivot or persevere. And, and that's really important when you're you know, trying to reduce waste in, in your own workflow process. Uh, likewise, with things like pattern libraries and more efficient templates and themes that you use, like for instance, in things like WordPress or Drupal, um, you know, reusing code, that kind of stuff. Um, from a designer and developer perspective, that's a way to make things more sustainable. Um, similarly, with open source tools and more efficient hardware, obviously on the, on the data center side. Um, and then just general greener standards of practice, making sure that you have, like we're a B Corp, for instance, so there's a philosophy within our company to adhere to the triple bottom line of people, planet, and prosperity. Um, and, you know, creating mission statements that are based around the idea of sustainability and that sort of thing. So making sure that those components are, are, are in place as you go about, you know, building, building your, or practicing. And so those were the areas that we figured out that we could improve and we put down a set of standards at sustainablewebdesign.org to help other designers and developers and, and companies that do what we do uh, adhere to more, you know, to, to, to bring more sustainability into their uh, workflows. Joe, you want to move on to the next one? 
So um, one of the things that uh, we were challenged with is, is trying to figure out, like, well, what is the carbon footprint of a website? Um, you know, there are very few people have actually tried to, to uh, accomplish that task or figure that out, mainly because it's really hard to evaluate the, the, the footprint. There is a, a lot of moving parts. If you think about the amount of electricity used on the data center side, um, if there's, there's a, the amount of electricity used in development uh, in terms of the actual creation, and then there's the electricity used in active use of, of, of these applications and, and websites. Um, we found that it was really difficult to get uh, data from hosting providers, um, that there's not a lot of standards out there. It's kind of an unregulated in industry. So for us as a web designers and developers, trying to figure out like where to find the most efficient data and, and um, there's a, there seems to be some greenwashing out there. Um, you know, there's we found one hosting provider that was like, yay, we plant trees, we're green. And that's awesome, planting trees is really wonderful, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the actual carbon footprint of, of, of their server, their, their data centers and stuff. So getting, getting real solid standards around data on hosting providers would be super helpful for those of us who build websites because it would help us make more educated decisions around sustainable choices. Uh, and then, you know, proving that those renewable energy sources, so as Joe was talking a little bit earlier about uh, renewable energy credits versus the solar array on the rooftop, just trying to figure out where that is and how that is, um, you know, how that works. For, for the uninitiated, uh, those of us who are trying to figure that out, it's really hard to find that information. Um, and then there's a lot of the variables on, on hardware and devices. So, like, you know, how, how much does an Android phone versus an iPhone use in, on the front end in terms of energy? Um, and while I'm sure there's that information is out there, I have yet to find, a, find it in one, one place. Like, uh, and, and if someone knows of, of where I could find that information, that would be super helpful. I have yet to find it. Uh, and then finally, it's really hard to measure the concept of user experience. If I'm a user and I want to make the most efficient choices on this web application that I'm using, how do I do that and how do, how do you measure that? How, how do you measure how many steps something is going to take uh, that, is, that is the most possibly efficient? And, and a lot of that can be done with um, like, you know, using uh, front-end optimization tools like Optimizely and stuff, but it's still, it's still kind of a, a uh, a subjective uh, subjective thing because if you're a user and, and not necessarily getting your needs met, not sure that, that software can tell you that your needs are being met or not. You know, data can to, to data you know data can tell you a lot about what your users are doing and the trends of what your users are doing, but um, it's unless you're actually getting real input from the people who actually use your your applications and, and pages, uh, it's hard to tell exactly specifically whether you're meeting your needs. And certainly from a you know quantifiable data perspective. So you want to move on to the next one? Okay, so uh, tools that can help. Um, we have found uh, a few of them out there, and we actually, given all of this, decided to build one as well, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, Greenpeace has a great report that they put out every year called Clicking Clean. You can go to clickclean.org uh, and you can review their report. It's a really great uh, um, breakdown of, of what's happening uh, in the industry. Uh, it's, it's, it's focused a lot on the larger players. As Joe was mentioning earlier, it's pretty cost prohibitive for a lot of smaller companies to, to make the commitment to, you know, 100% locally sourced renewable energy without renewable energy credits. So it does focus a lot on the bigger players like Amazon Web Services and Google and Apple and Facebook, etc. Um, but still, it has, uh, they have a Click Clean scorecard, which you can put, if, you, if you're using a Chrome browser, you can install in your Chrome browser. And then it, uh, it takes a lot of the larger websites, if you click on the scorecard, uh, uh, um, button in, in Chrome, it'll show you uh, what that company's commitment to, to uh, renewable energy is and how their energy mix breaks down, which is super helpful. Um, you know, the downside to it is that when it launched, it, it really uh, only tracked 120 different uh, sites. So there are a lot of sites out there on the internet that it's really hard to get data on. Um, so, but it's better, than, it's certainly better than nothing. It's a, it's a good start for sure. There's CO2Stats.com. I used it uh, when we first started learning about this, and, and, and uh, it it's kind of works a little bit like Google Analytics for, uh, for your website. Um, but I have 
who didn't find it to be very user friendly, and so we didn't end up going with with something like that, which is why we ended up building something called EcoGrader, which is at EcoGrader.com, and our the purpose of it was to help people find a simple way to make more sustainable choices on their website. So if you run an EcoGrader report on your website, it'll take some of the more common things that people do in terms of building a website and, and identify areas where you might be able to be more efficient in those. Joe, you want to move on next? So do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about this one, Joe, or, or do you want me to start? Um, why, don't you, why don't you start and I can jump in with a little sure. bit on, on our side. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for us, as I mentioned earlier, you know, figuring out, we didn't really even understand what Rex renewable energy certificates were when we started down this road. We were like, ah, I'm not quite sure I'd get that. Um, and so it was a learning process on that front um, to find the, you know, figure out the difference between, you know, somewhat a provider that uses Rex versus one that doesn't versus one that has, a, you know, on-site renewables. Um, and there's many flavors of, of uh, um, renewable energy. There's PPAs, there's, there's uh, you know, long-term, uh, you can buy large chunks of renewable energy, and, and uh, that's not something I know a ton about. Um, but we've also found it was really hard to find information on, on that kind of stuff. Like a lot of, a lot of providers will put a green page up and they'll talk about like their, you know, sustainability initiatives, but uh, there's not like a lot of, not, it's not, doesn't dive very deep. It keep, keeps it really high level. Um, I think the other thing for us was making sure that the commitment to renewables was, re re uh, was, was matched by customer service and reliability. Um, it's all of the renewable energy in the world doesn't, ha doesn't help if your site or app keeps crashing or if your uh, provider that you're working with doesn't have great customer service and you can't get answers to the questions that you need. Um, so making sure that they're good customer service and reliability for us was clutch. We needed to have that uh, in order to make more educated choices. Um, and then Joe, I think you wanted to talk a little about third-party specifications. We're a B Corp and so obviously we look for B Corps when we're doing that. If we know that when someone is a B Corp, they've gone through the rigorous assessment process that we've gone through. So finding other B Corps who uh, are in this space has been really helpful. Um, really helpful in terms of an idea exchange uh, as well as just learning from each other and, and, and helping each other make more sustainable choices. But I know as you've got on this other list of logos down here that there are some other ones, other, other certifications as well. Yeah, there, there are a number and, and you, you know, you kind of got to be careful with some of these things, you know, some are just paid listings. Um, so do your homework. Um, and there are others, you know, some of which Greenhouse Data aren't even a member of the, the Green Grid, for example. Um, you know, we've done some work with companies involved in there, but they're the folks who actually came up with that power usage effectiveness rating that is used by the whole industry now. Um, and that's basically a consortium of data center providers as well as um, people who are uh, designing and building the, um, the equipment that's going in there, you know, Cisco, um, EMC, the people making storage and network equipment. Um, a lot of those, those folks are involved with the green grid and their whole goal is to promote and design more efficient IT. Um, so keeping your eye out for these kind of things, and then of course, you know, B Corps, this is a, a growing movement that we're really happy to see. Um, and that extends also beyond just the efficiency. Um, look for a provider that's doing things like volunteering, you know, um, treating their customers and employees with respect. Um, it extends to that triple bottom line. So um, while sustainability is the most important, um, you also want someone that's involved in their community um, and who is practicing ethical business if you can find them. Um, right. And before we move on here, I just want to touch a little bit more on, on the renewable energy credits. Um, and, you know, for us, the, the best provider in the area is um, uh, renewable choice and so they, they've been really great and they've helped us kind of see exactly you know where our money is going um, and help us prove that you know we're actually helping to support um, the construction of new renewable projects as well as the ongoing operation of other ones and um, you know Tim said he wasn't originally too familiar with how these work 
and at a basic level, um, you know, these are available to anybody, including private individuals, um, and they are kind of convoluted, and some people um, do believe that they don't do too much, um, mostly because they're hard to track, and that's what's going to be the biggest thing about finding a, a quality provider of these. Um, so they're actually tradable assets, um, and they certify that X amount of energy was generated by a renewable source, um, and they're retired as soon as you buy them. So once you purchase that amount, um, it basically just represents that you helped pay for that amount of energy to go into the grid. Um, you know, it's, it's basically impossible unless you have um, a wind turbine on your roof to, to know that a certain amount of energy going into your building is green. Um, because it all just goes into the general grid. Um, so this is just one way to have a better idea on that. Um, as Tim mentioned, there's also power purchase agreements, which are another form of RECs that basically just say, you know, for a certain amount of time, um, you will buy a certain amount of energy from one provider. Um, so you'll see Google and Apple doing a lot of that. Um, where they're buying large power purchase agreements from nearby wind farms or solar farms that basically just guarantee that they'll purchase the amount of energy their data centers are using for the next 10 years or whatever. Um, and those are considered um, a little bit better. They're more trackable. They're going straight to a single place instead of having this intermediary in between. Um, but those are also not available everywhere. So um, you just need to make sure that if you're evaluating a service provider, they have the evidence to show you um, that, that they're trying to support this green energy. We've run a little bit long, so I'm going to jump over our uh, future trends slide here and just kind of get to, to our final wrap-up slide, um, which are key goals for improvement for everybody. So if you're looking for a service provider, as I was just saying, make sure that there's some proof to their green claims. Um, as Tim mentioned, there's a lot of people who have a sustainability page or a green page, and they talk about their dedication. Um, but you need to, to make sure that they're actually doing it. You know, when you're talking to a rep, how are they being more efficient? What are they using? Um, you can go take a tour. So if they say they're using containment on the tour of a data center, uh, make sure that those aisles are actually separated so there's not hot and cold air mixing, um, as I mentioned, like even messy cables, whatever. Um, ask them about what kind of cooling systems they're using. Um, and then what else are they doing outside of just efficiency or renewable energy? So that kind of touches on the B Corp thing. Um, and make sure that they're recycling their electronics, um, that they're generally acting in um, – for a responsible business. Um, and then just remember that green can come at a premium, but not always. If you're trying to sell efficient IT to um, the top level folks at your company, their first thing they're going to say is, well, green's going to cost more, right? And the fact is, not necessarily, because that efficiency directly translates into money saved, um, both on our side and your side. So if you put a server in our facility, it's going to be way more efficient than if you're doing it yourself, for one thing. And then we're also going to be more energy efficient than, you know, X provider. So that means that we might save $10 a month on electricity, $50. It kind of depends on your deployment, but that can directly impact your bottom line just on energy costs alone because a lot of times you're going to be charged for the power you're using within our facility as well. Um, and then if you're improving your own in-house IT systems, you know, talk to your IT team. If you have servers, um, ask about your heat containment if you have a whole server room. Ask if you've audited your servers to make sure they're all being used. You don't want any of those zombie servers. Um, do you have more equipment than you need? Can you consolidate? Um, if you're going forward in the future, look to the cloud first, you know, instead of buying new servers. Providers are going to be able to do this way more efficiently at scale than you can in-house. So while your IT team may be clutching to their servers, they don't want to let go of them, um, it, it can be way more efficient and greener to be looking outside of that um, to start. Um, and finally, as Tim went into detail about, 
make sure that they're optimizing your websites and applications. Um, the end goal is to have lower load times. They're consuming less bandwidth. They're designed with the end device in mind, that type of thing. Um, and Tim, did you have any final thoughts for us? Uh, no, I don't think so. You covered covered quite a bit there. All right. Yeah, I kind of crammed it in. And uh, sorry, everyone, we went a, a little bit over today. But um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope to meet some of you guys around. I know we've got some of the B Corp community here. Um, but anywhere else, feel free to follow up with questions. Um, and we've got some contact details here. Um, check out our websites. We'll send out a recording of this as well. So um, thanks again, and hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.